Good morning, Springfield Baptist Church. It's good to be with you this morning, and we're looking forward to the opportunity to worship together. And uh, I hope you join with us in singing wherever you happen to be. And uh, it, even though we're apart, we know that we're able to be together as the body of Christ. Today, as we're singing, we're going to be taking some time, and we're going to be uh, singing about the two ways in which God reveals himself. We're going to be singing about God's revelation to us in nature, and we're going to be singing about God's revelation to us of himself by his word. And, uh, and as we do that, uh, this is stuff that's pertinent to what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're going to be taking time and we're going to be talking about God's design as he reveals it to us and God's word as he commands and teaches us. So let's sing together. We're going to start out with How Majestic Is Thy Name. Consider the works of thy hands, the sun, moon, and stars above. What is man that thou thinkest of him who is so unworthy of thy love? Oh, Creation tells thy fame, heavens declare it, all thy wondrous works proclaim, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name, thou shalt ever be the same. Heavens are telling the glory of God, each tree points to Christ on high. My would God, the creator of all, take the form of lowly flesh to die. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name, mountains, valleys, all creation tells thy fame. Heavens declaring, all thy wondrous works proclaim, O oh Lord, our Lord. How majestic is thy name, thou shalt ever be the same. Jesus, creator and ruler of all, left heaven to die for me. Came to earth, laid aside heaven's throne, in exchange for death on Calvary. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name, how stands valleys, all creation tells thy fame. Heavens declare it, all thy wondrous works proclaim. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name, thou shalt ever be the same. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be together today in song and in your word. We thank you for your goodness to us, that you have called us to be your children, and that we are able to worship you. And Lord, as we look at the season changing around us, as we see the beauty of things beginning to grow and open up, we're amazed. We see life in all of its glory, and we recognize that this is a miracle that's from your hand. We thank you that we are able to be your sons and daughters, and we thank you not only for the physical life that we see as it's blooming and growing around us, but we thank you for the reality of spiritual life. The fact that because of Jesus Christ, we are your children, 
we belong to you, and we have hope not only for now, but forever. Thank you for what you have given to us in Jesus Christ. We're amazed when we consider that Christ would come, that he would die for us, and that in his resurrection, he would extend to us the promise and the provision of new life. We thank you now that we can be together, and we ask that our songs and our time in your word would be to your glory and honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, now forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, Sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto Pardon for sin, and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today, and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And as we consider his faithfulness, we also understand the reality of his beauty. The next song, uh, Fairest Lord Jesus, talks about the beauty of the creation around us, and it reminds us that it all comes from his hand and ultimately points to one who is in his love, in his sacrifice for us, in his holiness, in his righteousness, far more beautiful than anything we can imagine. One day, one day we know that we will see him. We will see the resurrected Lord and we will be with him forever. We're going to sing together, Fairest Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O Thou of God and man, the Son, Thee will I 
cherish Thee will I honor Thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown Fair are the meadows Fairer still the woodlands Robed in the blooming garb of spring, Jesus is fairer, Jesus is purer, who makes the woeful heart to sing. Fair is the sunshine, fair is still the moonlight, and all the twinkling starry hosts. Jesus shines brighter, Jesus shines purer, then all the angels can, can boast. Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son of Man. Glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forevermore be thine. We understand that one day we will worship him. We will see him face to face and as it says, glory now and forevermore will be his. Uh, in the meantime, we live in this world, and as we live in this world, God in his goodness has provided us, uh, in response to the living word, Jesus Christ, he's provided us with the ancient words, the ancient words that tell us about Christ, that tell us about what it means to be worshipers of God, and how we're to follow him. And so we look to these words as the truth on which we build our lives, ancient words. <laughs> words long preserved for our walk in this world. May we sound with God's own heart, oh let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength. Help us come in this world where we roam. Ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words impart. Holy words of our faith, hand it down to this age, came to us through sacrifice, Oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, 
changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. We have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. Well, it is good to be sharing with you today from the Word, and uh, I look forward to our time together, and I, I trust that this will be an encouragement and that this will be uh, something that is useful as far as your teaching is concerned. We're going to take a moment, and let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Father, thank you for allowing us to come to your truth, and I ask that you would teach us from it. We come to you as the one who has made us and who has uh, shaped what our lives are to be. We come to you as the source of ultimate reality and all truth, and we come to you as the one who we desire to live to follow. We pray that we would be truly worshipers. We thank you for the life that we have because of Jesus Christ and what Christ did for us. And I pray now that as we come to your word, your spirit would be at work in our hearts and minds and that we would live through your truth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've been with us over the last few weeks, you know that we've taken some time away from our study through the good news according to Dr. Luke for a short topical series. We're considering some moral and ethical issues that are particularly culturally pressing at this time in the light of a biblical Christian worldview. I've talked about the need to set our moral moorings, to make sure that we have the structure of our thinking firmly tethered to stakes that have been set in the truth of our maker. Today we're on a matter where our culture has made an enormous moral shift. The complete untethering of human sexuality from any basis in the creator's design and order. This has occurred inside of or largely been driven by an ideology called gender identity theory. It's an important thing for us to think through this matter biblically in the limited time that we have this morning. Uh, gender, gender identity theory, as it is playing out, has caused and is causing a massive upheaval in our society. At present, proponents claim that there are more than 100 different genders. And so the theory is destabilizing many in their understanding of who they are, causing enormous confusion for young people, and in many cases, giving approval to self-destructive behaviors. One of the best known mental health services in the world, the Tavistock and Portman National Health Services Trust out of the UK, notes that they have seen a 5,337% increase in requests for biological sex changes among young girls in the last 10 years. Dr. Lars Christopher Gilberg, one of the world's most published, most respected, most cited, child and adolescent development neuropsychiatrists states that pediatric transition is possibly the biggest scandal in medical history. But as I drive into the office through the week, on any given day, our national broadcaster, government funded, provides a pretty steady drumbeat in favor of some aspect of gender identity theory. It's become that culturally pervasive. As with some of the other matters we've considered, as this theory has been pressed forward, words matter. And as this theory has been pressed forward, Trojan horse type words are manufactured. So this is how this has worked in this case. For years, many of you, uh, if you heard the word gender, would understand that what you were hearing was simply a term that appeared maybe on a form and it would be interchangeable with the word sex. 
So you would expect to come to a form and rather than it saying sex, it would say gender and there would be two boxes, male or female, and you would have the choice to check one of those two boxes. The etymology behind all of this is, is as follows. The, the word originally uh, was developed inside of the old French language. In fact, in the 1300s, uh, in old France, uh, the word gender meant race or stock or family or kind or species. Uh, it had to do with the, the Latin gens, uh, which is kind. And, and as if you move on from there, by the 15th century, the word gender had showed up in the English language. Now, it began to be used somewhat humorously to emphasize how different men and women are, as if in some way men and women are from two entirely different species. And my guess is that at some time or another in your life, if you are married, you as a man or you as a woman have felt like the person opposite you was someone from an entirely different species. In fact, there was a book written a few decades back that was called, that, uh, that the title of it was Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. And we've all felt that way at times. And sometimes as we felt that way, we've said, viva la difference. And sometimes as we felt that way, we've said, the difference is driving me crazy. But this is, this is the reality of what that word was and how it was being used by the 15th century. In time, over time, uh, it came to be used to define biological categories. In fact, it was almost synonymous with biological categories so that, so that male and female were understood to be the two genders, although inside of language, for instance, there would also be a neuter gender. So you had male, female, and neuter. In other words, neither gender. Then in the early 60s, something different happened. The word gender began to be separated from physical makeup. As, as feminists were critiquing the culture and taking a look at the culture, they would look and they would see that there were different social and cultural qualities that were often associated with men or women that weren't essentially what it meant to be a man or essentially, necessarily, what it meant to be a woman. And so they began to use the word gender in this way. They used it to say things like, well, gender says that men are leaders, but women can take on leadership tasks and roles too. And there's truth in that. Or gender says that women are nurturers, but men can give nurturing care to children too. And there's also truth in that. So there was some legitimate and, and we would say even biblically sustainable ideas inside of this understanding of gender. But then it started to move toward reducing the word gender to being just the constructions and fabrications of a culture. In fact, gender itself was viewed to be virtually entirely a construct. And then there was an interesting stepping over, I shouldn't say interesting, probably a confusing and destructive stepping over of categorical lines to say that not only tasks and roles, but even biological reality and the sexuality for which it was designed could be torn down and reconstructed as whatever I choose. You heard me use the word deconstruction before there was a deconstruction that was taking place in the understanding of gender and moving across the lines that gender had been blurred toward a deconstruction even of biological and sexual reality. That's why in the, uh, as we talk about these things, this is often called transgressive ideology. Uh, some use the word transgressive in what they consider to be a positive sense. Transgressive or transgressing has to do with stepping over boundaries. That's what the word means. To transgress is to step over a boundary. And that brings us to the present confusion that exists in the form of somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 plus declared genders. And as you stop and you consider that, with a hundred plus genders, 
the word gender has been made both next to meaningless because gender means pretty well anything you can imagine and it has also become a tool to reinforce the animal, the autonomous animal worldview. It's, it's virtually weaponized as it's used in our context to fight for the autonomous animal worldview. Now there's much more that we could look into on this subject and, and uh, we could dis discuss, but our focus today is not discussion of that which is broken so much as it is we want to take some time and consider what is broken but then look past that at the truths in which we are to set our moral moorings. And so as before, as we have in the weeks past, we return to the bedrock of meaning in order to establish our moral moorings. We return to the truth that we are more than simply flesh machines. We are more than physical stuff clumped together that somehow started to function without design, without purpose, and without transcendent value. And, and so we start with the whole issue of the image of God. We start with creation design and what it tells us about who we really are and about who we are really supposed to be. Because as we look at what the word has to say about the creative act, creation shows us both an is, the reality of what is, and creation shows us an ought, the reality of what ought to be. Both of these things grow out of God's creation design and how creation took place. First, we are looking in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27, where we understand once again that as people, as humans, we have been created as the image of God. In Genesis 1, it says this in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So we see the creation of humankind. But then it's further explained in this way. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. This is the sacred place where all human moral discussion must start in order for there to be any transcending truth or meaning or purpose. It starts in the reality of the image of God. This is where all moral discussion and all meaning starts, in the image of God and humans as the image of God. My dog could do an act that would be very morally wrong for me to do as a human. He might do a savage uh, act. He might do a, a, very, a very vicious act as a dog. And while I would not like that act, and while I might even have to put the dog down if he was vicious and out of control for the act that he did, we would not say that our dog, my dog, had morally failed because of the fact that he is not a person. He is not created in the image of God, so there is no transcendent moral truth that binds his behavior. He acts on instinct. Humans are different. We have transcendent moral truth. And if we don't have that, justice is just powerful animals imposing their will on the weak. And, and Justice is, <laughs> justice is really not real. Uh, life is there to be disposed of or used by the more powerful animal or the more powerful group of animals in a utilitarian fashion. And even something like marriage, which we considered last week, is just an act of evolutionary self-interest. But because we are created with transcendent meaning and purpose, because we are created as the image of God, there is moral truth. The creator of the whole universe made us as spiritual, rational, personal beings to live in relationship to him and to each other. To live his goodness, to his glory, here on this tiny, unique, finely tuned for life and man 
planet. Now, we know that the first man and the first woman sinned. They rebelled against the goodness of God and they tried to establish their own goodness, which is exactly what Satan tempted Eve with when he said, God knows that if you take the fruit, you will be like him, knowing the arbiter of, the determiner of, what is good and what is evil. And we know that that's what humankind did. It tried to take the throne. It tried to establish its own view of what is right and wrong. And out of that, we know that we've all been born in sin, that the curse of sin passed on all of humankind. And so we try to be gods over our own lives and we try to set our own course. And maybe we defend it with the autonomous animal view of humankind. But we were made to be his image. And his design for us is right. And his design for us is life. And so it says here, in the image of God, he made him. Male and female, he made them. And so we understand that male and female complete God's image on earth. That is the is. Humanity is male and female. Insofar as gender relates to sexuality and biology, there are only two genders, male and female. Now, there are sexual genetic anomalies, just as there are genetic anomalies in other parts of our physical makeup. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 out of 1 million people will be born intersex. And, and these occurrences of intersex people uh, have both a makeup that is male and a makeup that is female. There are male and female biological characteristics. Typically, typically when we're talking about that, what we're talking about is characteristics that are visible characteristics on the individual. But even those who are born intersex at the chromosomal level are male or female. There are X chromosomes and there are X and there are Y chromosomes. And so they are male or female. And so this is the is. Every person is born male or female. And while the brokenness of the world means that there can be internal, emotional, moral, or mental struggles, we will continue to be what we were born through all of our days. Now, as we continue on in the creation account, the next chapter gives us more detail about the ought that creation displays. And this comes from the way that God went about creating his divine image as man and woman. And as we take a look in Genesis 2, we see meaning, we see a message in God's method. In Genesis 2, we read these words in chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This is at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. As chapter 2 expands on the creation act, we read a significant detail, an insight, in the way that God made Adam. Now, we talk about creation as being ex nihilo. It was out of nothing. There was nothing and then there was something because there was a, a, an uncreated someone behind it all. Out of nothing came something. Creation ex nihilo. Out of nothing, there was a lion and a lioness. Out of nothing, there was a bull elephant and a cow elephant. Out of nothing, there was a ram and there was a ewe. But as it says here, for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. 
As we read the account, only in this case does God specifically take a part of one creature and form the other creature. And there's a reason for this. There's a lesson in this. God wasn't just exhausted and running out of power to create ex nihilo. He didn't need some sort of seed or some sort of substance to do his work because he could no longer form things out of nothing. He didn't need to do creation this way. Instead, he specifically uses this method to give us a specific message. In his work here, Adam was allow God was allowing Adam to experience that without Eve, he was incomplete. And so he was demonstrating to Adam and to everyone afterward that without Eve, humanity is incomplete. And when we say incomplete, we're not just saying lonely. We're understanding here that Adam couldn't fully know what it means to be the image of God without Eve. So now he understands that she's a part of him, that she equally shares his humanity, but is distinct. And in the creation of Eve, God has completed the image of God. She adds meaning to the image that Adam could only incompletely display. She complements the divine image as it is in Adam and brings it to its fullness by providing what Adam is not. And Adam does the same for Eve. And this is a message for all men and for all women to understand. We need the other to complete humankind. An author named Glenn Stanton puts it this way, in both Jewish and Christian belief, male and female become fully human in their correspondence and contrast with one another. This does not happen solely in marriage, but it does happen most profoundly and mysteriously in marriage. Now, marriage contains other messages. Later on, we, we're going to be having communion together, and we understand that marriage is designed also to be a picture of Christ's love for the church. It's a, it's a metaphor of Christ's love for the church. But as we take a look here, the suitable helper from the rib, Eve, reminds Adam that the completeness of the divine image is in male and female. And, and as she is taken out of Adam, so marriage and its physical expression are built out of that reality. Marriage in its physical expression reminds us of the fact that humanity is complete in both male and female. If the divine image, humankind, is male and female, and marriage and its physical expression are to be a reflection of that duality, what does it mean then to go against God's design? Well, I'm going to ask you to turn over in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, because Romans 1 helps us to understand what it means to go against God's design, and Romans 1 is very much rooted in the concept, the reality of creation design. This is what happens when the representatives, the divine image, ignores the reality that they are to represent. Let me read for you beginning at Romans 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their heart to impurity, 
to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. As the Apostle Paul writes this, he is talking about the whole nature of humanity and where humanity has gone to in its defiance of and its stepping away from the design of God the moral design of God for us. Now there's a lot here for us that we could take time unpacking, but we're only going to be taking and doing a, a brief survey of what this passage is essentially saying. There are two means by which we know about God. Uh, there are two means by which he has revealed himself. One is the special revelation that we study and read that is his word. And the other means of revelation um, why well, we could also point to the reality of Jesus Christ, the living word, coming into the world as the, as the express, express image of God. But, but the other means which we have at our disposal, besides the word, is what is sometimes called general revelation, or the book of nature, or creation around us. When we take a look here in verses 18 through 21, uh, we see that God makes himself evident through the design of the created world. That's why it says in verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. When we look around, as we see creation around us, it points, to, it points to God's eternal power and his divine nature. Inside of this planet, we have what is evidently, to this point, a unique and persuasive display of his creative power and authority. We have something called life, which is really, really unusual in the universe as we so far know it. And as we think about God's creation and what God's creation reveals, we understand of man, we understand of humankind, that we are the crown of his creation. As the image representatives, then, we are called to joy in his greatness and goodness, and we are called to live out his design as we represent him here in this world. But even as we know that we're called to live out his design Going all the way back to Adam and Eve, we see that initial act of autonomy, uh, that, that push towards self-rule. Uh, we see the divine image going against what it was designed for, what, what they were designed for. Paul speaks about that now as we're in this chapter, and as he speaks about this, he speaks about how um, turning one's back on the designer and on moral truth can play out. And uh, as he does that, he talks first about the attempt to redesign God that we will undertake. Uh, the infinite transcendent God who alone is the source of truth is made by people to, to say what we want. We do that because of the fact that, uh, that we actually want to, to control him. Uh, that's what he's talking about here when he talks about exchanging the truth of God for a lie. 
uh, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Then, then what happens is as the image disconnects from the foundational reality of who God is, our creator, things really start to get messy. Uh, he talks here about the fact that uh, they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And, and as we think about that, we understand that no matter what your intellectual capacity, no matter what your ability to think rationally or to parse categories, if you're starting from a completely wrong foundation, you will derive wrong conclusions. The heart will be darkened to what is right and convinced of its own wisdom, it will miss its purposes and its end and it will head to foolishness. Um, the, the scripture makes it clear what it means when it talks about foolishness. Back in the Psalms it says, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. That's the person who is ignoring all of what reality tells us about why we are here, why we even exist. Uh, but even the designing of other gods that's talked about here, this idolatry, is really ultimately the attempt to be autonomous, the attempt to be God. Because when people designed idols and designed these images, they were trying to come up with something that they could manipulate, something that would satisfy their own view of right and wrong, something that would allow them to take sovereignty for themselves. They made gods that were controllable rather than taking a look at the design of the world around them and the creative order and, and, uh, and what it indicated about who God was and who they were to be. Now, the message of creation design calls us to our purpose. It calls us to honor God who has revealed himself in nature's design and in his word. But as the chapter goes on, we see examples of the rejection of the meaning of creation design. We see the rejection of the meaning that is embedded in design. Uh, and so, for instance, we see the rejection of people's own physical design from their exterior structure right down to their chromosomal makeup. Uh, and, and as they reject that design, the is, they also reject the ought that it sets out for how marriage is to take place, how physical relationships are to take place. It says, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. As we read these words, please understand that uh, I read them with the recognition of, of all of our sinfulness and the recognition of all of our human frailty. And, and as we read this, we recognize that we all go astray in many different ways. In fact, the chapter goes on and it continues to explain that. And as we read this, uh, I also read it recognizing the multitude of circumstances and factors that might make one reject their own design. Um, the reasons for rejection of design can be complex and can be multifaceted. Uh, I recently read the story of Debbie Karamer and uh, as I read her story I thought what a tragedy. This is a, a young woman who was sexually abused by her father as a teenager and, and because she was sexually abused by her father as a teenager, she didn't realize it was the because at the time. But uh, when she transitioned years later to try to adopt male form, uh, she, she lived as a male for 17 years. She didn't realize that she was transitioning because of complex PTSD. She was transitioning to try and escape something. She was trying to escape from the femaleness that had experienced abuse. And in the years that she lived identifying as a man, she came to realize that identifying as a man wasn't bringing her completion. It wasn't bringing her happiness. And it took intensive therapy to open her up to that realization. And this in turn has led her to transition back, to return to what she was designed 
to be. The passage, as we read it, goes on and it lists a wide array of ways we as humans reject God's moral design when we turn away from honoring him as creator and as the source of all truth and as our moral foundation. And if you're like me, when you read the list, you have to admit that you too have acted against your moral design far too many times. We read... They did not see fit to acknowledge God. God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous degree, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. As it's speaking there, if you read that list, I think as we're truthful, we recognize that we are sinners. We are all sinners. We are all people who at some point go against the moral design for which we have been designed. But our hope rests in this reality, whether we are talking about the brokenness of gender identity theory being lived out or whether we're talking about the brokenness of the myriad of other ways that we morally go against what we were designed to be as divine image bearers. Our hope rests in the reality that there is redemption. Uh, I want to read this for you. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says this in verse 9 as we begin there. <clears throat> it says... Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I read that particular section specifically because I love the words, and such were some of you. Uh, gender identity theory has led to the confusion of a hundred plus genders. As we said before, it's also made the word gender both virtually meaningless and also a weapon to shut down disagreement. Beyond that, though, more often than not, gender identity theory roots much of a person's meaning in their sexuality. Now we understand that sexuality and biology are very important parts of what it means to be the divine image of God. But as we return to the bedrock and foundational principles that we are first bearers of the divine image, that we are first persons who represent our king, creator, and the source of all reality and truth here on earth, the great question of human identity is not our gender identity. The great question of human identity is how we stand in relationship to our creator. And there are those who have rejected our identity as image bearers, and there are those who embrace it. And that's the great question of identity that we have to ask. Have I rejected my identity as an image bearer, or has I, have I embraced it? Gender identity theorists will often talk about the fact that people are born that way when they're talking about whatever, whichever of the many genders uh, they're pointing to. They're saying that people are born that way, even though the evidence of biology and neuroscience seems to support the reality that we are born male or female with the slim possibility of a genetic glitch that leads to a person occasionally being born with both sets of eternal structures. Biology and neuroscience don't support a myriad of genders. But born that way, that same phrase applies in our thinking in this way. Born that way for us means that we're created in the image of God. And it also means that we have inherited the broken sin nature from Adam. That means that we're going to tend to autonomy, we're going to attend to rebellion and, and disobedience against our king and creator, we're going to tend to pe be people who ignore God's moral design for our lives. But in Christ, there is redemption. 
in his death for our sin, God took the price of our rebellion against design on himself so that we could be made right with him. The greater issue of our identity then is whether we're unrighteous and have turned our back on our king and creator and on his moral design or whether we're redeemed. Whether we're made whole, not by our own goodness, but because we've trusted in Christ's sacrifice. We've trusted in the fact that he took the penalty for our sin, for my sin, on the cross. This last piece of scripture, as we have turned to it, is fitting because it deals with both the reality of identity, the fact that we're rebellious or redeemed, and it touches on gender identity theory when it says men who practice homosexuality. And it says, and such were some of you. And that conclusion is the conclusion in which we joy. Such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We are more than our desires. We are more than our struggles. We are more than our exterior characteristics or our internal battles and confusions and uncertainties. We can be redeemed because Jesus Christ died to redeem us. And there are many who have been. There are many who have trusted in Christ and who identify as redeemed in spite of their struggles, in spite of their difficulties, in spite of sexual drives that pull them toward disobedience and away from moral design. There are many of us who have been redeemed because of the fact that Jesus Christ has died for our sins. We are redeemed image bearers. We've trusted in the cross of Christ and we've established our moral moorings in the character of God. And this matters above all else. And such were some of you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for allowing us to come to your truth. And as we've come to the truth of creation design, and then beyond that, the truth of our brokenness, and finally, the truth of the redemptive working of Jesus Christ. We thank you that our identity goes far beyond anything that has to do with our biology and our sexuality. Lord, we know that this is a part of who we are as the image bearers. And we know that you have designed these things in a particular way. Male and female, you created them. And we rest in the truth of your design and we rest in the message, the moral message of your design for our lives. But beyond that, we rest most fully in the truth that we can be redeemed because of Jesus Christ. No matter what ways we might have gone against your moral design. We rest in the fact that because Christ died on the cross for your sin, for our sin, we can identify as redeemed. We thank you for the life that we have through him. May we be people who live out that life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been good to be with you. And uh, I hope that this has been useful as we've taken time in God's word. And uh, in a lot of ways, I feel like this is something that would happen better in the course of a conversation, uh, a back and forth and the opportunity to interact on the, uh, the many questions that might arise out of this. But, uh, but in the meantime, we take and we turn to God's truth. And as we turn to God's truth, we hear those answers and we seek to live in the light of the reality of his revelation. His revelation as we see it in creation and the creation order and his revelation, his special revelation to us as we see it in his word. Have a great day. May God bless you. We come remembering what Jesus Christ did when he came to earth for us. We are reminded of the fact that he took on a physical body and he did this so that he could experience the struggles that we experience and ultimately so that he could face the brokenness and death that humans face. And Lord, as we think of this, we think of the fact that he took in his body the, the 
punishment for our sins. And we are grateful for this. We recognize the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. And I pray that as we take and as we eat the bread, we would eat it in a manner that is uh, grateful, that is solemn in recognition of our own sin and the need that we had for forgiveness through the cross of Jesus Christ. And, and may we be people who desire to follow Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Well, as we uh, took time in the message today, we talked about the God's design for marriage, and we emphasized one particular aspect of what he was teaching us in the design for marriage, in his design for marriage. But uh, we know that there's something else very important that God teaches us through marriage. In fact, uh, Paul talks about this as a mystery. And what he means by mystery is not something that's mystical, but what he's talking about is the fact that marriage as it was given to us originally carried within it the seeds of a, a, a hidden truth a hidden spiritual truth that would be revealed in ages to come so the first marriage was given and in that first marriage there was a very very important lesson about what would come thousands of years later or who would come thousands of years later and we understand as we take a look in Ephesians that the the act of marriage or the, the joining together of husband and wife and, and the, the marriage covenant is a picture for us of the love of Jesus Christ for his bride, the church. And it says, as we take a look in Ephesians 5, verse 25, it says, husbands, love your wives, and then it gives us the example of our love. It says, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And the picture that's given us there of what a husband is to be is that a husband is to be someone who loves his wife in a sacrificial way as Christ loved the church. We understand what that means. We understand that Jesus Christ came in a physical human body and as he came in that physical human body he allowed his body to face the weaknesses of living as a human being but then beyond that we recognize that what he allowed himself to face was a, a, a horrible death. He sacrificed himself for his people. He sacrificed himself for his bride, the church. And as we come together one of the things that we are doing here is we are taking and remembering that Christ's body was broken for us. And that's why we take the, the piece of cracker that we take, this unleavened bread, to remember what Jesus Christ did for us. Unleavened because he was without sin. And, and this piece of bread because Jesus Christ actually came in a physical body. And so we read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The bread that we break, is it not a fellowshipping in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And what it's saying to us in that moment is this. It's saying that we commune, we fellowship with Jesus Christ himself as we eat this piece of bread. But as we eat this piece of bread, we do so along with brothers and sisters all over the place and together as we eat the bread we are fellowshipping in Jesus Christ so there is the fellowship that's horizontal between the body of believers and the fellowship that's vertical as we partake of this emblem of a body that was broken for us the sacrificial love of the great heavenly husband Jesus Christ for his bride the church let us eat it together. And Father, as we've taken the bread, the reminder that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, that Jesus Christ came as a human being 
in order to live among us, in order to face our weaknesses, and in order to suffer on our behalf. We now take the cup, the reminder that his suffering was even to death, that he poured out his life for us, and that as his blood poured out for us, there was in that the sacrifice that was necessary in order to deal with the just punishment that we deserved. We recognize that we have sinned. We recognize that because of our sin, we do deserve justice. And that justice is severe and that justice is full. But we know that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross and poured out his blood, took the full of that justice on himself. I pray that we would be people who are trusting in Christ. And as we partake of this cup, I ask that we would do so as people who are grateful, deeply grateful for the sacrifice that was made for us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul also says this when he is speaking about gathering at the table. He says, the cup of blessing that we bless, and by that he's talking about the emblem of the blood of Jesus Christ. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a fellowshipping in the blood of Christ? And as he's saying that, he's saying that as we take this, what we are doing is we're communing with Christ who poured out his life for us. And because he poured out his life for us, then we receive the full benefit of that, which means that we do not have to have our lives poured out for our sin. If we've trusted in Christ, Christ has made a sacrifice for us as that great heavenly husband for his bride that means that we are saved that we do not face the justice that we should face. And we are together now to drink this as people who have trusted in what Jesus Christ did when he was nailed to the cross and when he shed his blood for us. Let us drink it together. Father, as we have participated in this together, we do so with the knowledge that, as Jesus Christ said, the next time that he does this, he will be doing this together with us. We will be joined together with all of the followers of Jesus Christ from all of eternity, from all of time. And we will be celebrating, and we will be remembering, and we will be giving thanks for the one who sacrificed himself for our sin made life for us, made a way for us to be adopted as your sons and daughters. We thank you that we have been able to take time and that we've been able to join in this fellowship together. And I pray, Lord, that as we leave from this, wherever we are, that we would be people who are reminded once again in this moment of the incredible sacrifice that very God became a man, took on flesh, faced suffering in the flesh, and then poured his life out and poured his life blood out. We thank you for what Jesus Christ did for us. And we live gratefully, joyfully, looking ahead with hope to the day when we will celebrate this anew with Jesus Christ in your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for gathering with us today, wherever you have been, and uh, we pray, I pray that this will have been a, uh, an encouraging time for you, and we really do look forward to when we come back together as a body, and, uh, and let's pray for one another, let's uh, be aware of and, and seek to be in contact with each other, we want as much as possible to be encouraging one another. We know that this is a very hard time for some people. We know that others of you, yeah, others of you are probably doing quite well, but we know that there are people who are really struggling through this time. And so let's be an encouragement to one another, and uh, let's be faithful, faithful as we follow Christ. Have a great day. Bye.